and we're live. Welcome to the Sunday session. Football, I'm Steve Judge, your host for the Football Network World's weekly online discussion with football practitioners around the world. Um, today I'm joined by three fantastic practitioners. Um, we have Andrea Riboli, who's an Atlanta sports scientist. Of Sigrid Oltoff, a sports scientist and performance analyst now based at Liverpool John, John Moores University, and Rui Sarlamas, uh, who would say he spent most of his coaching time as a former coach of Porto B. Um, before I uh, allow introduce you properly to those guys, I'm just going to uh, share my screen with you to give a, a bit of information on the framework for for today's discussion um, so that you can share your questions with Andrea, Sigrid and Rui. Um, so as you can see, today's topic, small-sided games, the optimum pitch sizes for technical and physical development. Uh, once we get through that sort of, through the introductions, um, Sigrid, Rui and Andrea will uh, give their sort of presentations on on how they are focusing on, on small-sided games and how they're sort of drawing that information out of, out of the real game situations. And the discussion will kick off by looking at that area, what are, looking more deeper at what are the reference points they're taking from match games, uh, from their core game principles to the sort of event data points that they're using. And then in the second half of the discussion, we'll be sort of more focused then on the small sided games themselves and how they're taking that information from 11 v 11 to understand what are the optimum pitch sizes for the different small sided games from 3 v 3 all the way up to 9 v 9. And then how and why they're using small sided games. What is the, the, what is the training impact they're looking to get out of them? where they may change those optimum sizes to get different, different uh, effects, and, and ultimately how they evaluating those small sided games that they, so they know that they are having the desired impact on the players they're working with. But um, yeah, so that we can get into that, let me take this off the screen and introduce you to today's guest. Um, I'll start with um, Sigrid Oltoff, um, I believe, yes, yeah, sort of, coming to us out of Liverpool, but originally from, from Holland. That's um, great. Yeah, how, how are you today, Sigrid? I'm doing well, thank you very much. Thank you for uh, having us today. Um, now currently based in, uh, in Liverpool, uh, as you said, uh, originally from the Netherlands, um, where I did my, uh, my studies in human movement science and sports science and uh, ended up doing a PhD in, in, in football science, which I will be presenting on. And um, later on, I, uh, last year, I moved to the United States and worked as a, as a sports scientist for the University of Michigan. Uh, worked a lot with, with data um, and also focused on the, the transition of that data from, from practice to, uh, to the actual game, to the actual match worked not only with football as we know it, but also with American football and basketball and ice hockey. So that was a very nice experience for me, an opportunity for me to, uh, to further, uh, well, to have a further development as being a sports scientist. And since last summer, I work as a lecturer in um, sport performance and uh, performance analysis and analytics uh, for Liverpool John Walsh University. Fantastic. Yes, Sigrid, we're very uh, much looking forward to hearing more about your research on small-sided games. Um, we'll certainly get to that in a moment. Um, first, I'd like to then bring in Rui Sar Lemos, uh, who I sort of introduced, uh, thankfully, as a former coach at Porto, but there's been other clubs since then, which uh, Rui said it's probably best for me not to, because I was struggling with the uh, pronunciation. So I'll, I'll leave that to, to Rui to do. Okay, thank you. And hello, everyone. I hope everything is is fine and, and happy in, in this in this period. Um, I'm from Portugal. Um, I'm a UEFA Pro licensed coach, and I I have I studied in University of Porto. Uh, I started my my passion from from football there, and then I I moved coaching some local clubs, and then I was invited to to start coaching at at the most important experience to my. Uh, 
career at FC Porto, where I, I was there for for ten seasons, uh, doing all the all the all the wheel from from the bottom to to the top, and and my last spell there was three seasons at FC Porto B as assistant coach. Then I moved for a first division from Portugal club to be also assistant coach in the last two seasons, and uh, I, I hope that I can contribute with my experience and with my perspective and also every time uh, about quality, qualitative and, and subjective analysis of the, the way that we can create this kind of impact, technical and tactical impact in, in the drills that we want to, to create. And so uh, everyone, thanks to Steve for the invitation and thanks for, to Andrea and Sigrid to, to being here, to sharing their immense knowledge. Oh, brilliant. Yeah, it's a pleasure to have you with us, really. And I'm looking forward to how you're sort of using those small sided training games, both in your time working within the youth development phases uh, and also yeah, with, uh, with a, at a first team level. Um, and finally, yeah. I'd love to bring in our, our uh, third guest, uh, Andrea Ribelli. Uh, Andrea, um, firstly, yeah, how, how are you doing today? I am fine, thanks. Uh, I am. I want to thank uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. I, my name is Andrea Riboli. I'm a sports scientist and strength and conditioning coach. I got a PhD in sports science at the University of Milan, and uh, since about ten years, I'm working as sports scientist and strength and conditioning coach, both with youth and adult soccer players, professional soccer players. And um, at the same time, I conducted different type of research project in collaboration with the University of Milan or other department uh, in Italy or, or abroad about training load management. So the main aim of my work is to collect information on the pitch, uh, try to manage this information to, to share uh, feedback to our coaches, uh, to sport, uh, sports, other sports scientists on strength and conditioning coach. And uh, try to manage this information in practice. So to utilize this uh, whole data that we can collect uh, for practice, uh, and at the same time to try to perform research from real life context. So this was the the work that I was conducting over the last year uh, in Italy and uh, in uh, in soccer. Fantastic. Thanks, Andrea. Yes, we'll. Uh... Yeah, look forward to hearing more about the research you, you've conducted. Um, but I think first I'll bring back Sigrid and, and hand over the screen to Sigrid. And uh, you're all in for a treat here with Sigrid has actually added a, uh, added a, a title page into her presentation. So we're all looking forward to seeing that as much as, as uh, the details of her, her research. So Sigrid, it's, uh, it's all yours. Thank you very much, Steve. Um... Yeah, as a, as a scientist, I always uh, try to support my, um, you know, my, my presentations with sound argumentations. And, and Steve put me up for the task to only put five slides today. Um, um, so I will, um, I will keep it short. Um, but if you have any other questions today, um, feel free to reach out. I put my, uh, my contact information below. You can either send me an email or find me on, on social media like Twitter. Um, in, the, in the announcement of, of this uh, Sunday session, um, we, we focused on the small sided games for physical and, and technical uh, performance. But I thought uh, from my background and from my research, I focused on the team technical performance as well. So I thought that would be a nice addition to the Sunday session. Um, as I said before, my name is uh, Sigrid Oltov. Um, I'm currently a lecturer in performance analysis and analytics at Liverpool John Moores University um, in the United Kingdom. Um, but today I will focus on, uh, I will present my work uh, for my PhD study, which I conducted at the University of Groningen in the Netherlands. So I thought when we would talk about small sided games, it's good to present you a, a definition of small sided games as well. I think everyone has an understanding what small sided games are. But if we look in the literature, um, I think this one is the, the most uh, common uh, definition for small sided games which are training formats, which resemble or look like the official match. And where manipulations are made in either the number of players, the pitch size and the playing rules. And 
um, predominantly the, the influence of the number of players and the pitch size have an influence on how players perform during the games and during and, um, and how they affect physical, technical and tactical performance. I, um, I displayed two situations from, uh, from, from the match on the left hand side and from a small side game on the right hand side. And if you look at the typical small side game, this is like um, a most used small side game in, in five versus five played on a, on a pitch size from 40 meters in length and 30 meters in width, which is ver very common, both when you look at, the, at science as in practice. When you look at the official match, the official match is played on a pitch dimension of 105 by 68 meters. It's, these are the official pitch regulations uh, by the FIFA. And of course you play 11 versus 11. And when you, when you compare the left um, uh, picture with the right picture, you see uh, uh, it makes sense. You do some adaptations in number of players in the pitch size, and it's, but it still looks like football. But if you compare the, uh, the actual dimensions of the pitch, uh, you can use the relative pitch size or the individual playing area. And you can calculate that as the pitch area divided by the number of players on the field. And if you then compare the small sided game with the actual match, you see that the area, the individual playing area of the match is 325 square meters, whereas in the small sided game, it's uh, 120 square meters. And if you uh, like look, search in your literature, you see that most common, the most common small sided games are played on a pitch size less than 150 square meters. So if you compare, what is the effect of that small pitch versus the large pitch? So on a small pitch, we've seen, we've learned from previous research that the distance between players becomes smaller. That has a consequence in um, the final, the passing distance between players that also becomes smaller. And because the density of players is larger because there are the players stand closer to each other, there is an increase of, of tackles and duels and there's an increase of ball interception. So the, the position of the ball alternates between teams back and forth, like very quickly. And you can say that eventually the team tactical performance changes as well. The team tactical performance, you can quantify that as the, as the distance between players or the distribution of players on the field. So when I started my PhD, I thought, well, Football may be too complex to only play on small pitches and also in, in small numbers because there's so much going on and, and players need the space to explore on the field and to move the ball from one, one part of the pitch to the other side of the pitch. So that is why I came up with, um, uh, with my small side game research. And um, I used the, the official, uh, official match as the, as the starting point. And as I um, explained before, um, well, the dimensions of the pitch are very important then. And uh, we use the relative pitch area of this official match, and we applied that in, in the small side game research as well. So what we did was um, using the, 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 the dimensions from the official match and applied that to the different small side games. So for instance, the nine versus nine game was played on pitch B, the seven versus seven pitch was a play on, on pitch C and the five first five game was played on pitch D. I think if you look at it, th those pitches are larger than you would commonly see in a regular uh, football practice. We also played this with four different age groups and um, during our um, uh, experiments, uh, so we played these small side games with, uh, with a lot of age groups, but we also re uh, repeated those uh, small side games a lot to, uh, to get a lot of data from these games. And we, we track the players on the field with this um, uh, local position measurement system. So we could follow the, the players on the field wherever they are. And there were three uh, youth academies from uh, Dutch football teams were included in the study. And uh, we used the data from, the, from their teams to, uh, to, uh, to, to, to get our findings. And I thought instead of um, um, presenting you a lot of graphs. I thought it would be nice to, uh, to present you this drone video. Um, I hope you can also, you can see it well, uh, otherwise you can find it on my Twitter account as well. 
You see here a drone footage of, um, of the, the, the games that we played. And this is the first clip from the 11 vs 11 game. You see that uh, the, the goals are just on the place where they are. You see two teams of 11 players and you see them moving up and down the field. In the second phase, we played the nine vs nine game and we moved up the, the goals towards the, 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 the uh, five meter boxes. And when you look at the distance between the players, you see that on average, the, dis the distance between the players are similar from uh, the 11 vs 11 match. And you see how they uh, move up and down the field. You see how um, um, the, the, the area of the players is similar as uh, in the match. So when we use, and I, I think that's the key finding of this, of this research, um, when you use the similar area as the match, you um, present uh, the, a similar time or you afford a similar time and space for your players. And that results that uh, the distance between players maintains similar, and not only the distance, but also the area of your team. So we con could conclude that um, because of the similar areas to match, there's also a similar team tactical performance. And we found this across all the small side games that we played and also all across the different age groups that we included. It's the final game, five versus five. And you see how players can move up and down the field and the area between the players maintain similar to what it was in the match. So for our key findings of our studies, um, when we look at small pitches, um, most times th those are used by, by practitioners, coaches, in order to enhance uh, decision-making of players to act quickly under the pressure of time. When we look at the larger pitch, um, those might uh, afford the players a more meaningful context as it is in the match. In a small pitch, there are small spaces and maybe limited variation for the players to, um, to explore and to, uh, to, uh, to play football. And on the large pitch, there's more space for the, for the players to explore the space in offense, to also to, to have a, a collectively uh, defending uh, organization. And it offers more variety in the pace of the game and the actions that the players can do both on the ball and off the ball. The key applications here is that we uh, designed a, a dashboard for, uh, for, for teams that participated and I also presented in my PhD thesis that um, if you look at the, the lower row of the, of the dashboard, you see that whenever, whatever game you would play on this larger pitch dimension, the team tactical performance will, is similar to what it is in the, in the full size match. And another application is that FC Groningen even designed this, their training ground along the lines of the, the research and um, um, they designed uh, the different pit sizes and put that on, the, on their training ground. Thank you very much, Steve. This is it. Excellent. Thanks, Sigrid. Yeah, it's a, a nice uh, introduction and, and an overview of your work and uh, yeah, really good understanding of how you're taking that full size 11 v 11 and adapting it for the small sided games and very much with the with the focus on the tactical outcomes, which uh, sets us up nicely to bring in Rui uh, and I'm sure there'll be more of a focus here on on the technical as well as maybe a bit of tactical Rui. Yeah and first of all uh, I want to to say that, that I really that I really agree with what Sigrid was saying because if we abuse from small spaces the quality of, of the acquisition isn't optimal right so this is because and she was she was saying very well because small spaces can give us uh, a false perception regarding the, the awareness and, and the analysis of, of the context. So uh, the right, and I believe the, the best path for, for us coaches is, is to produce like a, a combined effect uh, where we connect small spaces with, with large spaces to, to get both, both contributions from, from the context. And, and so moving on and, and just starting um, my presentation, I will just open this in one second. Uh, I just want to touch on a few topics. 
um, just like raising uh, ants and, and letting questions in the air. Uh, so uh, for everyone just that just joined now, I'm, I'm Portuguese. I, I, I've worked in, in FC Porto for a few years. I'm a UEFA Pro licensed coach and I studied at University of Porto. Um, that is my, my profile, my, my experience and, and professional and academic background. Um, I, I was lucky to, to, to have a very interesting players in my path that helped me now looking backwards to, to realize uh, a very important things regarding training and very important things regarding their development. And, and so on, I think we, we always need to, to, to learn from every situation that we are. And also I have a brief experience for two years in a first division in Portugal, where it was also very important for me to learn and to, to adapt to, to the professional side. Um, just moving on from this, uh, my, my perspective regarding the, the game is, is the tactical side. Uh, I've been making a lot of analysis on that, but uh, my acad academy background always uh, create me the context in my mind to, to think about how we need to create the best conditions to produce quality players. And, and that's also a thing that I, I want to, to speak here. And I also believe that uh, the non-linear question of, the, of the, the training is also important because in our pets, probably we 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 are going to find this kind of players we have here robertson from liverpool and jamie vardy from from leicester that probably were low performance but high potential players in, in their academy years and so on they they were discovered a little bit late uh, to the talent that they have and that also because of the of the kind of of experience that they had in, in the academy and so on we need to create context to find and to develop any kind of talents that we find in our in our path, because uh, as we see here uh, throughout the years, performance is not is not stable, right? Because the year we find Bernardo Silva and his rel relative size with 19 years old is not the same with uh, with 13 or with 15 if he is a, a late a developed mature uh, player, right? So his potential is continuing to grow up, but his performance is, is different and so on during also these ages, the age of 13 or 15, for example, for this kind of players that are not developing physically in the same, um, in the same uh, rhythm than, than the others. We need also to create context to, to not to lose this kind of, of talents. That is the most important uh, job for us. And, um, and also to speak about this, this topic here, that is that uh, if we jump uh, the, the part of the communication of the verbal activation or, or, or of the verbal explanation in the exercise is the right context for us coaches to be even better because it means that uh, we are creating better drills. And believe me that the better drill for a 12 or 13 year old kid is the drill when where you you don't need to explain him what to do because he will feel about the context and the drill that you create what you want him to do so if we if we as a coaches we design one drill with goals on on both sides for example he will understand by his intelligence that you want them or you want him to, to close very well the flanks, for example. So you don't need to explain that. So if we, so I, I wrote here, the bigger the jump between uh, information, communication and the interpretation, uh, is, is, that means that the, the, the drill is even better. And, and just, just to, to, to finish uh, during also the, the podcast, I want to, to give two examples of, of the communication between going from training to match and also going from match to train. This kind of adjustment that we need to do when we are preparing the drills and the exercises. 
And uh, I have two examples to give that from two different situations of this, this kind of nonlinear progression. And that's it. I, I just wanted to raise some questions and, and hope that we have a good chat here. Okay, Rui, yeah, thanks for that. This gives a nice uh, introduction into, into your focus, how you like to set up your sessions and what are the, certainly the communication points there, which are very key. Uh, yeah, it'll be good sort of then to say that a little bit deeper in a, in a moment to sort of understand then once we're getting into these small sided games, what they look like for you, what it is your, your, what are the outcomes you're looking for. Um, but now we sort of have a, a physical sort of element to, to these small sided games and we'll bring in Andrea. Andrea, the screen is all, all yours. Okay, thank you very much. Nice. I will give you some of the information we, um, some of the research we conduct over the last year from practice and in collaboration between the University of Milan. And uh, we try to collect information from the pitch, trying to do research to increase our acknowledges um, inside the club and sharing with information to increase, increase continuously our acknowledges, uh, comparing it with uh, our results with other uh, researchers around the world, in Italy or around the world. So it's a pleasure to, to share this information with you. Firstly, as um, Sigrid and Steve said, uh, highlighted very well in their presentation, as Mo said, the game, uh, are uh, we need to take it in consider as Mo said, the game as a great puzzle where technical, tactical, psychological, and physical aspects are some of the parts of this puzzle. But we need to take it into account that there is a great interaction between all these aspects. And so we need to, to think about all these aspects to, to try to apply this information in, in our practice. Another part of this aspect and, uh, and well, yeah, that, that I think it's really important is a, a, a link between training and match. Over the last year, we, we thought about a lot about the, the link between training and matches because uh, uh, the aim of our work is to create performance, uh, is a performance development for our players. So this part is really important and probably is another part that should be taken into account in uh, to, for planning a small side game on the pitch. We collect uh, a lot of data, uh, both with youth and adult soccer players. Uh, today I share you some information from academy player, uh, more than 280 individual uh, observation for small side game and more than 2,500 individual observation from adult soccer players about small side games, both small side game possession play, so without the goalkeeper and a small side game with goalkeeper. What we found, these results are based on a small side game with the youth soccer players from under 15 to under 19. This graph is only a simplification of our results and represents the average locomotive demands in uh, uh, using different types of small side game are clearly exactly the same as small side game across each categories. And this represents very high speed running distance, sprint distance, and acceleration and acceleration. The aim of this comparison was to share information with our coaches about external load. And the, the, the main aim was to create a link between external load performed during small set game and match demand. So for acceleration and acceleration, we found a similar external load from different small set game across each categories with match demands. So about 10% higher, but no significant difference external load during small set game in comparison with match demands across each category. But if we go to see very high speed running and sprint distance, the results was uh, about 50% lower external load during his most study game than uh, match demands across each category. And for sprint, there are significantly differences for each category with more than 70% lower external load in most study games than match demands. In, so this graph represents the, 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 the great part of the training activities uh, with the ball during training routine in soccer, at least in our experience. 
The second results will be based on adult soccer players. This graph is based on more than 150 different small set game format. Every circle is a different format of small set game. And on X axis, you can see the percentage of match demands. The horizontal dotting line is the average match demand. And on X axis, you can see different uh, metrics. And uh, we can, as, as you can see, for very high speed running distance and sprint across each different small set game format over five seasons for more than 1,050 different formats of small set games for very high speed running and sprint, we don't have high speed running or sprint similar to match demands. So we, we have also with Hadul a lower external load during small set game during, during soccer routine uh, than match demands. So probably this information both for IAF and other soccer players should be taken into account. Recently, we published a paper to try to uh, better understand which pitch size we need to utilize to recreate some condition are similar to match demands. And we create a link between area per player in meter square per player and uh, the intensity for different metrics in meter per minute. And we found for high speed running that we need to utilize for small side game possession play without goalkeeper, a, a minimal harder per player of about 1,066 meters square per player. But for small side game with goalkeeper, where we have a great tactical aspect then small side game possession play where the player are free to move, we need at least 262 meters square per player. So a minimal higher per player of 262 meters square per player. But interestingly, if we want to um, replicate or overload some sprint activities similar to match, both for small side game possession play or small side game with goalkeeper, we need to take into account at least 300 meters square per player. This is really interesting because I, I saw also the results from Sigrid. Also from a tactical point of view, we need to, to take into account a similar pitch size. In, or during official matches, we have uh, 340. If in our study, we, we did not consider goalkeeper in this calculation or 320, as I previously said. But we need to take into account at least 300 meters square per player to replicate sprint demands uh, similar to match. So these results should be considered when we go to plan activities on the pitch using small steady games or using sport specific drills. So uh, in practice, uh, the, the main aim of our work is to try to reduce the training and match gap. And the question, in my opinion, is, is in line with the title of this, of this talk. And the, the real question is, the size matter? I, I, I'm happy to, to share this information with, with Rui and Sigrid to talk about this, because it could be really interesting. Thank you very much. Fabulous. Thanks, Andrea. And yeah, that's, that's the big question. Does does size matter? Um, I guess to, to begin that, that discussion, I think we'll, we'll probably start with the, with the full size, with 11 v 11, which is, which is the reference point for, for all, of, all of us in this, in this work. Uh, and maybe to begin with, with you, Sigrid, and when you're looking at 11 v 11, what are, the, what are the key reference points you're looking at in terms of the principles of the game and, and then digging down into the sort of those key data uh, event points that you'll take to sort of do your calculations for the small sided games. Yeah, um, that's, I think I totally agree that that's a, that's a, a good starting point. Um, most times I start my presentations with a quote from, from Gary Lineker about football is a simple game. Um, but in the end, uh, well, the Germans win. Uh, that's the end of his quote. But um, football is a simple game, but it's also like a, it's a complex system. Like teams are a complex system. There's so much going on. There's a ball, there's offside. There are 22 players on the field. There's only one, one player in ball possession. And all the others try to uh, make themselves useful in order to either help scoring a goal or uh, defend that or pre prevent that from happening. 
So that makes um, this is a complex system because um, there are a lot of interactions on the field. There are a lot of players that that cooperate with other players or compete with other players. So that is the, the, the starting point that I use. There are 22 players on the field and they, they move up and down the field. They, they increase their space in order to, to keep ball possession and move up towards the, the goal of the opponent. And the others try to reduce the space and try to prevent that from happening. And hopefully in the end, uh, try to, to regain ball possession so they start, can start their offense. So that is the, the, the starting point that, that I took. Those are the, the, like the, cons, the constraints of, of football, basically, what, uh, so to say. And I tried to, to replicate those traits and those interactions also in the small-sided games. Of course, I see the benefits of playing small-sided games on a very small pitch. But sometimes you some actions are overlooked when you really constrain players in a very small setting where the density of players is very is very high um, and you lose some uh, a lot of those traits that also happening that are also happening in the, in, in the official match um, so those are the principles that i take so there's there's there are 22 players on the field there's offense there's defense and and the players that try to position themselves on the field in order to uh, to um, contribute to their team goal and their team goal is score a goal and win a game um, and players are interacting in order to make that happening um really and sort of to to sort of build build on 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 series foundation there i mean yourself as a as a development coach and looks like being a first team coach what are how are you being informed by the game when it comes to designing your your training sessions what are the key principles you're taking out of 11 v 11 yep. what are the parts of the game that you focus on most when you're then transferring uh, it to the training pitch i like to be very um uh, objective in terms of of giving examples to to create some some kind of idea in everyone's mind and i want to give two examples of of this kind of of way that uh, I think this connection between the, the 11 versus 11 and, and the kind of, of core principles that we, we follow. And uh, in, in my last club, in first division, we, we had a match against the best team in the league. They were champion, uh, league champion. And um, the problem for us to make this transfer from the 11 versus 11 for, for the training, the problem for us was, okay, if we split the quality of our team to make two, uh, two teams of 11 and we make them playing against each other, we cannot replicate the same, for example, the same pressing intensity that the, the opponent, the best team in the league, that was Benfica, uh, is going to, to, to create and, and to put us in pressing during the match, right? So that was the first problem. So. The second option was, okay, we don't split the team. We make the best 11 and then we put the other 11 players. But the, pro the problem re remains because uh, from a, a bottom league, from, from, from bottom league club, uh, the substitutes, they cannot replicate. It's obvious the same pressing intensity that the best team in the league is going to replicate. So the decision was, uh, changing the space and keeping the best 11 in one side and the, the substitutes in one side, but changing the space and, and reducing the depth and reducing the width of this kind of 11, 11 versus 11, we uh, found the solution to, to replicate the same pressing intensity that our uh, lineup players would find in the, in, the, in the match. So this kind of changing the, the format uh, will 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 help us to to create real context because as Sigrid said the game is simple and the game is complex so in order to to change some kind of 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 variations we cannot lose the real essence of the complexity because sometimes if we change too much uh, we are breaking the the complexity and the 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 non-linear order of this. And, and the second example that I, I want to give is, is about 
sometimes you are going to, as a coach, you are going to find one team that, for example, before a very difficult match, they need uh, more space to win confidence. And then you're, you will find other kind of teams that they need the positive approach. For example, if you are making, uh, preparing a very important game, you are going to feel if your players, they need uh, you to make the 11 versus 11 in the formal space, right? Or if you need to reduce the, the, the space for them to find some kind of challenges and to raise their, their intensity, their quality level, their concentration level in order for you to prepare the match. So I think if you look to the complexity of the game, for example, I want to, to work the build up from the mat, the, the build up from the back. Okay. But I want the same kind of pressing that I'm going to find in the match. So I need to, to pick up this part of the, of the, of the game, but without changing the, the, the all, all the other aspects of, of the match and how can we do that? I think is moving, uh, changing the, the numbers without changing the, the nature of, of, the, of the game, changing the space without changing the, the, the real nature of the game. And, um, and sometimes the progression uh, is, not, is not linear. And I just want to finish with, with a last example that is, um, Sometimes we, we want to work the finishing, um, the finishing uh, capacity of our players and of our team, right? And, uh, and if we are coaching kids or professional, it's the same. And what is the normal approach? We, we start making a five versus three plus goalkeeper, and then we progress for a six plus uh, versus four plus goalkeeper in that specific uh, linear order. And we make this because this type of drills, they theoretically uh, create a context for the offensive team will have the time, will have the ball uh, for a longer period, right? And so want, we want this kind of context to explain what we want offensively and we think to work the, the finishing uh, capacity of the team. But I agree with this kind of, of progression, but I also need we I also want to 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 think in a complement complement way. So think about working your finishing capacity, uh, creating numerical inferiority uh, situations in attack. For example, three versus four plus goalkeeper. Why? Because that is the connection for the eleven versus eleven. We, when we play in the last third, and when a player has the ball in the last third, it's all about having the sense of the opportunity and that killer instinct in the, with the ball, right? So if we uh, habituate the players making the f five versus three situations all the time, all the time, we are not creating this kind of sense of opportunity and we are not creating this kind of killer instinct because in a five versus three, they have the ball and they look for the, the space and then they decide. They have the ball, they, have, they look and then they decide. And that's not the same nature of the game. Instead, if we create a three versus four, they, when they receive the ball, they will know that at, at the minimum space and at the minimum uh, momentum to shot and to, and to finish, they will take that chance. And that is real game situation okay that's great yeah some nice insights there really particularly uh, around you know, interesting side you know how looking at the opposition and how you then bring that back to your own practice how you prepare your players for that um sort of bringing andrea on on those topics um and looking really much at the physical side and you certainly touched on it in your, your presentation, the sort of the de accelerations, decelerations, and um, total distance covered, sprints. Um, I just wondered how you're breaking down the game to measure those. How are you looking at the key principles of the game of in possession, out of possession? Do you look at it, Andrea, as a, as a whole, or how these intense sprints are taking place in transition in different parts, parts of the game? 
clearly as a uh, from a, a strengthening conditioning point of view and sports scientist point of view, we need to analyze uh, um, uh, official matches and uh, 11 versus 11 matches because uh, this is the reference for performance. Uh, clearly, performance is more than, than only the physical part, is, as, uh, as we said before, is, is a great part, but we need to take into account some aspects that can, should be considered. Firstly, we need to consider the match and the official matches as a possible reference. And at the same time, we need to consider the, the physiological ability of, uh, of different players because um, uh, sometimes, for example, for central defenders, central defenders could perform um, some external load activities, but uh, their performance ability could be higher than the, the 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 performance required during the matches but we need to take it into account match performance for uh, for training the player player according to the, for their position and during our practice i give you an example and we uh, during my presentation I, I said you some information about the 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 minimal hard player required to replicate match demands uses more steady games uh, but uh, when we go to to consider the match demands we don't need to consider wholly the average match demands because this could be a reference but could not be represent the the, the most demanding passage of match play of the matches so for a practical point of view we need to consider uh, the average match demands across the 90 minutes, but we need to consider different time window across the match analysis at 11 versus 11 analysis and official match analysis, because we need to take it into account the most demanding passage of match play over a four minute period, over a three minute period, over one minute period, because we can recreate uh, all these aspects using, for example, positional drills, small study games, or other type of exercises during our practice. So uh, the, the match demands uh, should be the minimal reference for, uh, for training practice. Um, for, a, for I give you a practical example. Uh, we can recreate for forward and wide forward some uh, positional drills uh, uh, lasting one minute with one minute of recovery. And we need to we can take it into account uh, the most demanding passage of match play for one minute uh, across the matches as a possible reference uh, to recreate this condition uh, during the, the our our practice during this type of exercise, this type of drills. Um, another example could be normally we utilize a small set game, um, 10 versus 10, five versus five in a, in a different pitch size. And we can take it into account not the average match demands, we need to, to think at the average match demand, but we can take it into account also the most demanding passage of match play over, for example, the 10 minute match demands when we when our small set game lasts 10, 10 minutes, for example, or the most demanding four minutes when a small set game lasts four minutes. So we need we can uh, manage training load accordingly with the most demanding passage of match play in accordingly with the match demand, at least using a sport specific activity. Clearly, sometimes uh, during practice, also using, for example, friendly matches is not simple to recreate such conditions similar to the official match demands, but uh, we can consider all these aspects, the average match demands, the most demanding passage of match play across different duration uh, to try to replicate at least the external and internal load during our practice, also using, for example, friendly matches. If we can, we can introduce some role during the activities using uh, uh, the live feedback from GPS, for example, to, to share this information with the coaches and the coaches could, could uh, uh, increase the intensity using some different rules or some different aspects. And uh, but we, we need to take into account the, the as a minimal reference the, the match demand uh, because this should, could be mm, uh, mm, uh, a way to try to replicate the, the performance requirement during, during the training. And uh, but clearly, we need to consider this aspect for each position as a minimal reference because sometimes athletes could have, a, from a physiological point of view, higher performance ability than those required during matches. So we need to take it into account the, the match demands, the future match demands across different time windows to replicate this aspect, to overload this aspect, but also 
uh, we need to have a point of view on physiological profile, but match demand is clearly one uh, great important focus for us as training condition. I see green only so having sort of heard um, the approaches there of Andre and, and Rui. Um, yeah, I just want to sort of see how yeah, your reactions to that, how that compares to your own approaches in terms of, of, of your research and how you've built this model for a sort of optimum pitch sizes, where, where you see the similarities in the sort of reference points that you use and where things are probably maybe slightly more drilled in for specific outcomes with the, with the guys who are working in clubs. Yeah, um, I think those are maybe two different uh, approaches, what Rui and Andrea just uh, explained. And I think, um, and if I can like summarize it in, in, in a couple of sentences that Rui mainly focused on like specific um, uh, situations from the match and they and, and he enlarged those situations. So he uh, manipulated the pitch size, made it smaller in order to uh, get more pressure from his defenders on his uh, attacking uh, line and where Andrea said well we use the match as the um, um, as the um, starting point so we look at what the physical demands are from the match uh, for my players and that we try to build our small size games in order to replicate those, those demands those are two different um, uh, approaches but both it's not that one is better than the other um, uh, I think what, what uh, I try to um, display in, in my research is that when you reduce the pitch size, you really focus on who has the ball and who is closest to the ball. So um, when you have the ball, when you play on a very small pitch, um, you only have a few, um, you have a short time to make a decision. So uh, that because the players are already close to you, you already have your defender close to you. So you really should make a quick uh, decision in order to pass the ball to your next player. The next players around you, you both your team members or your team members, they have limited space to explore. So they have limited space to find out where they can go uh, in order to become a, a, an opportunity to receive the ball. The defenders, on the other hand, they have an easy job. They, their job is to regain ball possession, and they're already close to their um, um, to their opponents. Um, so it's it's mainly an easy job for defenders in a small pitch size because you're already close to your opponent, so it's easy to take over the ball and 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 go on. But so what you see in the small pitch size is that the ball position alternates like quickly back and forth. And if you have the aim for the co as a coach to uh, that, that is your outcome of your practice go ahead but you will lose uh, a lot of information that you have from the from the match so all the the players that are not in ball position they they lose a lot of their action opportunities to find out on the pitch uh, because they don't have the space to explore like the what the research from andrea already showed there's just there's hardly any sprint uh, there's less uh, high speed running distance so um and that also um results in like where are players moving on the pitch and how do they collectively um, attack and defend um, even if you look at the role of the goalkeeper um, look at it, any small sided game the role of the goalkeeper is like limited he's he, he needs to react quickly he doesn't have the the space between the defending line and and in front of him or her um, uh, to cooperate with his defense so whenever the ball goes uh, there's a high ball. Uh, you don't see you don't see any high balls in, in small on small pitches. So there there are the, the, the there are actions. Um, so it's it's good for uh, pressuring of the opponents. Good for transitions of attack to defense and vice versa. Um, but you you lose a lot of action opportunities. So if you take the match the the match outcome what Andrea used and what I used as well. Uh, to look at this as a whole, a uh, holistic uh, approach, uh, look at what players do during that entire match, look at it from a physical perspective and from, from a tactical perspective and try to replicate that in small sided games. Uh, you might want to consider um, enlarging your, your pitch area. 
because that gives the players the opportunity to collectively um, attack and defend that results in, in tactical performance, what I explained, but that also results in the physical performance that Andrea highlights. Like if you enlarge the pitch, you give players more space to make that sprint, um, either to chase the ball or to chase the opponent. Um, you also need to cooperate with other players because you're further away from your opponent. Um, and further away from your opponent means you cannot just step in and, and try to take off the ball. You need to find, like, uh, work together with fellow defenders to, um, okay, what is our plan? How do we defend our space? In which, where are we positioning? Um, we have to do it together instead of on a small pitch, you, it's an individual game. And on this larger pitch, it's more like a collective game. Could I, could I give an, an explanation? Of, I totally agree with Sigrid uh, about uh, all this information. And I will do to share another, another, uh, another type of, of, uh, of, of data that, that we normally see. As trend and conditioning, we need to, uh, to consider the individual physical development. And uh, from an individual physical development, we need to take into account also the, uh, the demands of different small study game for each position, for example, for each individual player, uh, for each player, but also for each position. And normally, when we compare the, the small study game demands with the, uh, the, the match demands or, or the most demanding passage of match play uh, during official matches, normally we, we found that uh, Central defender, for example, uh, recreate more simply their external load demands or internal load demands similar to match requirement. Also using uh, a small, a little bit smaller pitch sizes, but clearly in line with our results. Uh, for example, sprint are not recreated without uh, a pitch size in area per player similar to match demands. But if we move to to think about uh, a forwards, for example, a wind forwards during small study games, they don't have the, the space for a counter attack or for other type of action that is really important for them during official matches. Because during counter attack, they, they work a lot, they sprint a lot, they need to increase their velocity. But during small study games, they, they, they don't have the space. They, 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 they play in a, in a very different uh, way. They, they need to. to have their shoulder and the goal uh, uh, behind, and they, they 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 play in a different uh, in a different uh, way, and uh, the the external load, uh, especially for uh, forward, is very very different from their requirement during the match. So, if we uh, use for the most part of the training activities, small sided game clearly. Coach prefers small side game because it increases the number of touches. We try to collect also this information, and it, clearly the coaches like this aspect. But as training condition, we need to take it into account to the external and internal load demands. And so, if the small side games are the, the most important hacks that take a lot of time during the training session, we need to, to, to think about the external load and try to manage. Uh, uh, physical performance development using positional drills to increase their these demands continuously. But probably um, the, the best way should be to collaborate and try to increase the performance demands, the, 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 the training load demands uh, exactly in the same way, uh, collaborating between coaches and sports scientists to try to, uh, to increase the, the performance similar to the most passage of pass, uh, the most demanding passage of match play during small study games. So to try to increase the time and exposure to match demands during sport specific drills, uh, usually utilized by, by coaches. So uh, 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 the important information about the tactical act that the Sigrid said has before uh, should be taken into account because also the tactical aspect should be more uh, replicated using large pitch size, 300 meters square per player. Uh, uh, physical part 300 meters square per player, uh, uh, tactical part 300 meters square per player, this probably is an important point of view to take into, into account for a uh, training process. And I'm really interested to know the Rui point of view, what, what you think about this. Yeah. Uh, let's imagine, for example, uh, we, we want to, to improve in our football team, uh, our pressing, as, as Atalanta do, do it very well. 
our pressing and our cover channels, for example. Um, my perspective and my technical perspective is, uh, is not only about the drill, it's more about the, the process, right? So it's, it's more about going from the big pitch and then to the small pitch and then in the next day for the big pitch again. It's, a, it's about this kind of process that we are working and creating that pressing uh, context uh, situation. So uh, my uh, sentence is, is not about the drill, it's more about the combination of the drill. And let's imagine this example of the, we want to improve the pressing in, in, our, in our team, the pressing ability in our team. So starting in the big pitch um, and then going to the small pitch will help the team uh, to create the, the main idea and the, and the context and then in the small pitch to, replic to re replicate it tactically and technically speaking, right? So we go to the big pitch, we put the, for example, 10 versus 10 or 11 versus 11, we give the, the, the main ideas, the main principles and then, for example, in the, in the next, in the following exercise, we can reduce the pitch and make, for example, a 7 versus seven or six versus seven, even more competitive, where they can apply the principles that you were giving in the, in the last exercise. In the next day, we can do a different, a different approach. For example, we can start with a small pitch when we probably continue what we were doing yesterday. So giving some kind of shadow positioning. So if one goes there, the other covers. So the position in a small space as as Sigrid was, was saying, everyone is close. So it means the space to, to, to cover is not, is not too much big. So it's more about the interaction in the, in the, in the area of the ball. But then you go back to the, to the big pitch and you go back to that big pitch in a different point that you were when you were starting in, in the last day. Because you have more complexity, you have more sub principles in your game because of this kind of process that you, you were doing. So I think it's about this kind of process and this kind of construction of, of, of the game. And that's why I agree with Sigrid and, and Andre, of course. And that's why it's all looking for the game, see the, what, what the game tells us and then build in training. And then it, just to finish is, is only about to design the tendency what we want for the drill because it's not the same to do uh, a five versus five in a flat pitch or in a vertical pitch uh, or with a goal with a mini goal in the middle or with mini goals in in the side so then it's just to move the rules move the tendency what we want and then you have a flat pressing or a stable pressing horizontal pressing or a vertical pressing with more transitions with more forward passing and then it's all about the tendency that you technically want to create for for the exercise i have a I'll, could I, I ask another question there because it's really um when you uh, talk about a small study game uh, do do you uh, consider the number of player or the pitch size for example, when you talk about small study game, in your opinion, um, is important. The, the, uh, do you think about the, the same number of players, but in a, in a small pitch size? Or are you thinking to only a, a low number of players? For example, moving from 5 versus 5 to 10 versus 10. Because this should have a, 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 a different point of view because it could be useful. I, I want to ask you if in your opinion, it could be useful uh, for, uh, for your, uh, your aims, for tactical aim, moving from small to large. It uh, could be possible, in your opinion, to maintain a similar, as Sigrid said uh, before, a similar pitch size relative to, to net pitch size is an area per player, reducing only the number of player to, for your aims uh, from a, a technical point of view. Could be this a strategy for, uh, to maintain whole aspect of tactical, physical, and technical, but using always the same pitch size in area per player, but decreasing only the, the number of players. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think you have also potential and also a great insight on that idea because uh, we can create this other 
different kind of tendency if we make, for example, a three versus a three in a bigger pitch that we, we used to do in, in normal circumstances. We are going to, to teach them and to create conditions for them to learn that, for example, uh, doing a three versus three in a larger pitch than, it, than in normal conditions, they will learn that, for example, if they lose the ball often, they will run much more if they don't lose. So they will evaluate uh, the, the, the importance of, of having the ball. So making, uh, I completely agree with that, also with that approach. So I, I reinforce even the, the, the idea that I want to give to everyone that is listening is not only about the drill, it's about the process that, and, and the process is the combination of this kind of approaches and the, this kind of drills. Of course, that we need to have a uh, methodology, right? But our methodology needs to, to be just to build the game and just to create conditions for them to develop your style of play and for them to develop their own intelligence. And if it's with a big pitch and then move to a small pitch and then keep the same numbers as you were saying and then open the pitch again with the same numbers and then reduce the space and put bigger numbers, I think it's about playing with this to create technical conditions to style of play and intelligence. Uh, good answer, good answer. Um, I think we'll try and jump into a, a couple of questions here from Ibon Echezara. I hope I'm uh, pronouncing that correctly. Uh, around sort of both kind of linked around uh, representativeness of, of the task and the constraints and the sizes we're using. And probably start with Seagrid. And if all of us, we start with this idea of, right, we're absolute beginners in understanding this relative pitch size that we're going to use. So if we have Seagrid, if we take your model as being our mean starting point, so the, the, the different pitch sizes that you showed in your presentation, presentation going from the 11 v 11 and, and clearly coming down in relative size with the, with the, with the size games that are being played. Um, just wondering if you could share what the actual calculations are you're using to go from 11 v 11 down to the 5 v 5. Yeah, I think uh, what Ivan is, uh, is is asking about uh, representation of the of the task and representation in this case means um, do we replicate the match with our small side games? Um, if we take the the starting point of a small side game, you make a manipulation in either the number of players, the pitch size, or the playing rules, or uh, you make a combination of everything. If when you do that, um, you already um, make some um, compromise in your outcomes. Um, one study that I didn't uh, didn't show today was we looked at the performance in 11 versus 11 in the match, and we looked at the performance in 11 versus 11 in the practice. And even that everything is similar, the rules, the number of players, the, the pitch size, we already found that there were differences in physical performance and also in the interaction between teams. So even if you don't make any um, ma manipulation in either in, in any of the, uh, the games um, or in the pit size number of players, um, you already see uh, a modification in the performance. So whenever you make a uh, adjustment in your small size game, you know you will affect um, your outcomes. So you will affect your physical performance, your technical performance, or your technical performance. But there are a couple of rule, rules of thumb in, in this. If you go smaller in your pitch size, you will um, see uh, a different physical performance and you will see a different tactical performance. Physical performance is, is less in terms of like less sprinting on a smaller pitch, less high speed running. Uh, and the tactical uh, performance, you will see uh, the distance between, uh, this, uh, between players become smaller and the area of the teams will be reduced. Um, so that is like the, the gliding scale of from, from going from a large pitch towards a smaller pitch. Um, and it's up for you as coaches, sports scientists, everyone who's involved in football to make a decision, okay, what is my cutoff point? What do I think is acceptable for my physical and technical performance? And on which pitch do I want to play? 
if you look at the number of players, if you reduce, if you go from 11 versus 11 and you do reduce the number of players, you will see that it mainly affects um, the, the, the technical performance. And now that we quantify the technical performance in the number of touches on the ball, and you can include a lot of variables, but if we only focus on the number of touches on the ball, the number of passes, you will see that with less players on the field, the number of touches go up. And it makes sense because there are less players to pass the ball around. So you, that's also one of the, the overviews that, I sh uh, that I've shown you in the, in the latest phase that in 11 versus 11, there's 90, 90 minutes being played, but you only have the ball as an individual players for, what is it, two minutes? Uh, whereas if you pl would play um, 90 minutes, five versus five, you're in, your context with the ball will increase a lot. So that is that is the gliding skill that you will that you will see from playing on a large pitch towards a small pitch. You will uh, make you you will compromise in the in the physical performance and the technical performance. If you go from a large number of players to a small number of players, you will see an increase in touches on the ball. And that is the complex complexity because football is an interplay. It's an interplay of physical, technical, tactical performance. You got the um, psychological uh, influence in that as well. You got the crowd, you got a referee, you got a different opponent, an unknown opponent. The, the, the consequence of winning or losing is, is very high if you play just a competition game or you play a championship game. So that is that is all different. That's all, that, all those factors will affect, affect how your performance is on the field. Um, so um, I'm, I'm not sure if I can also address the second question of Ibon if um, five versus five played on a relative space of 300 square meters, so the large pitch, or 11 versus 11 on the relative space of 100 square meters. I think that that is one very nice research paper out there. 11 versus 11 on a very small pitch. So let's say you play 11 versus 11 only on the half of the field. You will you would see that players will run everywhere. So players don't stick to their position. They try to be, to contribute to the, to the game. They try to get ball position. They try to um, find space. So you will see in that research that like players don't, do not stick to their positional role anymore. So they're not the midfielder anymore. They're not the defender anymore. They try to like walk or run everywhere on the pitch. So that is what the, the reduction in pitch size will do to your players. Um, players will always try to maintain that distance to other players. And what they will do is try to, to, to position themselves on, on a place in the field where, um, um, where they're not supposed to be or what not their position is. So uh, you, see, you will see a, a forward, a striker on a very small pitch. They, you will see him going back, uh, try to get the ball from the defense and try to make his move up there. Um, so those are the rules of thumb, <laughs> large pitch, small pitch, large number of players, small number of players. And that will affect uh, the game anyway, because um, that is how football is, that is how um, players are. Um, but you can give them the circle, you can give them an environment that they replicate as much of the uh, demands that you will also see on the official match. And Andre, so yeah, I think you're going to jump in, but I was going to add to a question to what you're going to say is also like within your practice, um, with that idea of a rule of thumb, is there, you know, you have an idea, this is our baseline for 5v5, this will be a, the pitch size that we'll use, the optimum pitch size from which we can go up or down depending on what outcome we have. Do you have that clearly defined in your practices that you know, these, these markings are already out on the training pitch, similar to how, how um, Sigrid presented it in her, in her presentation. Or is it very random, do you find? No, no. Yeah. I, I give you an example from practice. Normally, uh, we, we take uh, all this information from, from practice. So we, we, uh, we have collected information from different pitch sizes, from uh, small pitch sizes, large pitch sizes. And, uh, and uh, we normally, when, when we want to increase the external load and the internal load, 
we we take into account a large pitch size normally because we can overload the the match demands and we can increase the the, the physical development uh, and more than a small pitch size and from another point of view based of internal load responses not all external load responses clearly the heart rate could be similar uh, for example, higher than 90% of maximal heart rate, both in small pitch size and in large pitch size. The, the most difference is based on external load demands that increase significantly, especially for sprint using large pitch size. Um, I when I um, now when I, I'm I went I, I listen now the secret uh, aspect based on, on tactical performance. I, I was talking about uh, this aspect, modern football. Uh, nowadays is based on a lot of matches. So we don't have a lot of time to train, okay? Uh, so probably uh, my question is, we need to take it into account that a more holistic approach and when we have time to, to train our players, uh, for example, only one day in, uh, in, uh, in, in the week when we have uh, uh, only one match per week, probably only for uh, uh, not starters when we play three matches a week, we have one day to train at highest at the high intensity activities our player so probably my question is we need to take into account uh, a more holistic approach using a, a greater pitch size and harder per player and, and try the, to to manage only the number of player maintaining the same pitch size uh, for example near to 300 meters square per player for example uh, five versus five in an alpha to increase the, the demands both for uh, to maintain tact, some tactical aspect, some technical to have space to, to increase sprint uh, and have, try to have a more holistic approach to use this most of the game because we have only uh, a low number of training where we can increase the activities because we, we have to play a lot of matches. And this is uh, this is my question. Every day I have my this question is in my in my mind when we go to to, to think uh, about the training process. I'm not sure, but I think probably it could be better because our players should be, uh, we need to develop performance. Performance is created by a lot of aspects. And uh, so probably to manage the, the pitch size, we can take it into account of the, the pitch size similar to match because from a physical point of view, you can maintain this aspect and train this aspect uh, using different time duration. Uh, from a tactical point of view, we can maintain some aspect. Uh, from a technical point of view, also clearly not not an overload from a tactical point of view, but uh, maintain some. So probably from a, using a more holistic approach, my question every day in practice is this: um, it, it could be better to increase the the time spent during training activity using a little bit greater pitch size in the plan independent from the number of players that could be uh, should be should by the choose by the coaches clearly uh, they could utilize this information as as a strength and conditioning point of view we can suggest to utilize a little bit larger harder per player similar to to, to matches, for example, to replicate, uh, uh, to use a, a more holistic approach. This is a, a really important question, especially in this time where we need to play a lot, a lot of matches. The modern football required to play a lot, a lot of matches. We don't have time to train. Probably in, in that day, we need to have this more holistic approach, but I'm not sure I would have also the, 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 the feedback from Sigrid and Rui. Right. I uh, absolutely. Uh, on that as well, I just want to sort of feed in because uh, Ebon has come back with a point which maybe you can also address yeah. as part of the questions that he's put. So on top of that, he said, so on the back of what Sigrid and, and Andrea have, have, have discussed there, so could we say that representativeness appears when player positions, the demarcations emerge? Is that yeah. Yeah, and, and most of all, um, when demarcations and when passing lanes and when the good decisions uh, with the ball and good decisions without the balls, they, they appear. So it's, it's not only about moving, it's also about what the guy with the ball is doing. And if we, we are creating the context for them to demarcate and to move a lot, but the, the influence of uh, or the decisions 
of the guy with the ball are not good enough also because of the, the pitch size we need to change and we, we need to also to to look on that um i i really think that the we cannot obligate and we cannot uh, forbid right so if we obligate uh, with the, we lose the representativeness if we forbid we lose the the representativeness because we are closing the bounds and we are closing the options and during the game sometimes they find and we need to think about that sometimes we are training players that have more potential as a players than than we have as a coaches and sometimes we are forbidding them to do something but their intelligence and their potential is even more bigger than our first ideas so uh, i also believe on that we, we can evaluate we can give even more value for something that we want them to to do that that tendency that i was speaking but forbid and obligate i think there is no good no good uh, options when we are trying to to create the real comparison to to the game can I add a small comment to that, Steve? Of course you can. All right. Um, I think also what, what Andrea um, just outlined about uh, what you do on training days between three matches. Sometimes you have a very dense schedule, one game a week, or, you, or three games a week. And sometimes you have a less dense schedule, one game a week. I think um, it's, it's about the variation that you try to apply. Um, so I don't advocate for only playing on large uh, pitch sizes or only playing on small pitch sizes. It's um, the, the variation that you apply. And even if you have the, the, the three games in, in um, the three matches in a week, um, maybe the, 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 the training day in between you um, um, maybe you want, want to create a bit more variation because players are already attuned to that large pitch, to the dimensions of the match. So with these small side games on a large match, you try to attune players to learn um, and to put them in the environment of the match, because otherwise the only training um, or the only match stimulus is coming from the match. And um, sometimes you want to apply multiple um, of these stimuli during your practice week when you don't, when you don't play as many games as that Andrea's team is playing sometimes. So it's all about the variation. Sometimes you want to create um, the match stimulus when you don't play as many games. Um, so then you want to apply the, or you want to play on those larger pit sizes. Sometimes you want to make the pit sizes smaller. Um, so you create that variation. So players will adapt to different situations. And that is what football is. Football is a game of uh, complexity with a lot of different uh, situations, with a lot of variation in, in actions, both on the ball and off the ball. And you want to bring the players in those situations as well. So you want to apply the variation in your training week. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you, Sigrid. That's what I was trying to say when I, when I was saying that the process is about combining the, 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 the spaces, but continue, please. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, that's a very. I think we're all on the same line here, and I think with with these type of small size games, we just offered um, a, a new dimension to small size games because I think that not a lot of coaches already play in these large pitch sizes. I think from my own experience, when I offered or when I went to the clubs and say let's try to play these games, they were like, yeah, that's a good idea, and then um, we laid out those pitches, and they were like. Is this the pitch that we will play five versus five on? Is this is not a nine v nine game? And then uh, the the first time that they actually played the game, they were like, "Oh, this is this this look this looks well. the 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 players like it. They are engaged. Um, they they we didn't give them any um, uh, task with them. Just play the game and try to win. Um, and and they just started playing. And you saw that the the behavior coming back. That is also being presented from the match. So they they, they increased their, their playing area, they decreased, they played a long ball, they sprinted. 
um, the, the, they were uh, communicating with the goalkeeper. So the goalkeeper was not only trying to catch the ball, what was normally being done in, in, in the really small, small pitches, but they were actually building up. They were um, trying to, when they were really in a dense and, and tight area as a, as a team, they tried to get out the ball and try to move the ball to the other side of the pitch. So you really saw that all the behavior coming back from uh, the official match. And I think that is what it is on, on the representation or the representativeness of those small side games. I think if I um, can make a reference to, to Yvonne's question is, um, does representativeness appear when player positions emerge? I think that is one outcome of representat representativeness, but also what players actually do on the field. So do they replicate the variety of actions? So do they play a short, a short pass and a long ball? Do they um, make quick cuts and turns and, and changes of direction? And also do they, do they make long sprints? Um, and also, do they vary in their team tactical behavior in, 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 in increasing the space and decreasing the space? For me, that is representativeness and representation. Yeah, yeah. and just to give another example, just to show how, how large this, this kind of thinking is, if we shorten the, a lot and just to, to go a little bit in a, not in the opposite way of Sigrid, but just to give uh, the perspective that training is really about your idea and creating your idea okay you you need to improve uh, your adding ability so representation is also about for example closing the space and stretching the space and playing for example in one box and then you have a four versus four game with uh, neutral players on the sides and they and they if they put the ball out and then he cross and that that's a goal and then the the goal value value is three that's also representation so I completely agree what uh, Sigrid was saying about opening the space to have mo more vari vari variety and variation of, of action, from short passes, long passes, dribbling, running with the ball, seeing, pressing. Very important detail is having a lot of, have a big area to cover because in small sided games, we just have a small sp space to cover, but in a bigger space, we need to decide if we go there to press or if we stay. And that's also training and that's also intelligence because in small sided games, we go everywhere, we press everywhere. And it seems that is okay, but the game is not that. The game sometimes is just to stand out, just to wait and just to decide and to protect the best space. And also these, these other reverse point that if we stretch the space and if we close a lot of space that's also can be representative for the game it depends of our objective uh, yeah, i think there's a lot in there that possibly uh, helps to answer this question here from nico egno who's asking should average passing length in a match affect pitch size area in small sided medium size and large sided games so when you're looking at those variations yeah uh, is, is the average yeah, passing length in a match a, a sort of key, yeah. key part of the thinking. I, I would add not on, not only passing length but also space coverage. For example, if you are if you have a team of Los Celsius, you need a, a some kind of of space for your small sided games in order for you to replicate your own game. Or or if you have a team of Los Celsius and Ilicic and that that kind of players, the space is one. But you have if you have a team of Nandombeles and Sissokos and, and those kind of midfielders, different midfielders that you play better with more spaces, with more uh, space to cover, that the space needs to be different. I, oh, so I believe also that there is a specific uh, space to, to you or own team. Yeah, um, that's a very valuable question as well, and a very valuable comment of Rui. It's, I think what we all agree on is that we uh, we, we see the, the the benefits of variation in the pit sizes, and um, if you look at the, and we, I did not explicitly measure the the passing length in my research, but what I did is um, measure the distance between players, um, and from that you can derive what the passing length would be. And what we see in, in, in the actual match is that the, the average distance between players is like 
what is it, 15, 20 meters between players on average. Um, and you will try to replicate the, the, those distances in the small sided game as well. And if you reduce, like that's what we all started with, when you reduce that pitch size, you see that the average distance between players becomes like six to eight meters. So you will affect your passing distance uh, when you reduce your pitch size. Um, so, and in, in my research in those larger, larger pitch sizes, we saw that the average distance between players maintained um, uh, that 15 to 20 meters. So you will see that the average passing distance in a match will be represented in those small sided games. And when I say small, <laughs> it's always a bit, a little bit difficult to explain that be because small sometimes refers to the pitch size or re refers to the number of players. Um, but yeah, uh, we all use different terminology for that, but the small side games is, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> sometimes it's a small pitch, it's a larger pitch, but we all combine it in, into small side games. Yeah. Probably, so, sorry, could I, probably uh, to, to be more consistent to speak about smaller rice side game could be utilized the, the Arab player similar to match. In the future, this approach could be more consistent to help a researcher or practitioner to speak the same language, in my opinion. And about the, the passages, I, I give you uh, our experience. We, we never um, study the length of the passage, but we try uh, across our practice to, to collect information about the number of passes per minute across different formats of the most of the game and try to compare this information similar for uh, uh, the, the data that I said to you before about external load, a link between the pitch size and the, the number of passes per minute. Um, and we we found an interesting aspect that we we need to replicate the number of passes similar to measure. We we need to have uh, uh, more than uh, than two thousand meters per players uh, as are per players. So if we our coach would to increase the number of passes per minute with respect to the, the number of patches during the matches, they need they 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 can utilize smaller pitch size clearly, but. Um, also, a little bit larger uh, pitch size uh, expresses Naira per player uh, at least 200 meters per play permit to replicate or simulate the number of passes per minute similar to match uh, demands. So also this information could be useful in practice uh, for, for coaches to, from a, a technical point of view, in my opinion. Yeah, that, that is also some, I'm picking uh, this excellent example from, from Andrea. Uh, for example, if you if you are head coach or coach from from a team that that is a normal uh, offensive PPDA of, for example, seventeen or or twenty or uh, passing passes during during possession before before losing the ball or, or shooting, and if you have a, a team that is used to to have a lot of, of the time with with the ball. And if you are creating a small-sided game in space or in numbers, and they don't they don't have the ball the, the time enough or the, with the connections enough, that's some kind of red flag for you to to think that that is not having the the real representation to to your game. If they are losing the ball a lot, simply saying. Um, I think yeah. To to wrap things up a bit. Um... That we've covered a fair amount there. We sort of understood the actual pitch sizes themselves and around the various outcomes that we're looking for from them and, and how they're possibly monitored. So if we just discussed actually the input of the coach within within this format. I mean it's quite clear that all of you have sort of mentioned at some point that the training situation is going to be slightly less intense than the real game. Players are not going to be pushing themselves at that level. So as, as coaches, the importance there to, of communication, use of voice to maybe in, sort of to bring out that intensity into a session, but just also being, as I think as you mentioned, Rui, just having that clarity of communication so the players are very clear on what are the objectives of any given exercise within a small sided game. Yeah, the, the communication, sometimes the best communication is not to communicate and not saying by, by rule, but, but why? 
for example, we want our team to close the middle. We want to work that on the on the next drill. And if we gather the, the kids, let's imagine that they are kids. If we gather the kids or the professional players and we say, okay, guys, we want you to close the shape, to close the middle, to press the ball, to, to cover the, the zone of the ball, to stretch the line, to go up. You say everything that you can. Okay, their mind consciously and subconsciously is going directly for that. And in a team, you have some kind of players that, that are, have a creative mentality and some of them, they have a rational mentality and some of them, they have like a mixing of those two. And you as a coach, you need to coach every, every, every single player, not only the rational players. So you need to create conditions also for the kids like Neymar, for example, the potential Neymar, they, are, they will also find solutions, even better solutions than, than you find. And so on. If you don't explain that, and if you just create a tendency in the exercise of, you create the space for, for the pitch, the best space. You are doing, for example, a five versus five, and you put one mini goal in the middle, and you don't, don't say anything. You just say, go there and win the match. If you win, it's better. Go there, and if you win the match. They will realize, and they will start communicating not you communicating, they will start communicating between each other. Okay, guys, we need to close the middle, if, otherwise we, we don't win this. And they will find even better solutions to create the context for you as a coach in that precise moment to communicate. And that's also a different level of communication. Is, is going from, in the first bad example, in my opinion, that I was giving, is going from the professor in the room explaining to the to the students but football is not only is not a, about that football is about creation creativity is about decision making is about instant decision making so you create the context the players go there and then in the right moment you spot on the, the communication um, and see through your research and you sort of mentioned sort of coaches sort of making that adaptation to the sort of bigger pitches for the small sided games, but in terms of how how the coaches then are putting themselves in, into those sessions, where do you see that there's strengths and weaknesses within that? Um, of these, the type of small sided games that I presented to you? Uh, um, not the, the coaches themselves. So when the coaches are in those, I think you sort of, sort of alluded to the idea that clearly a training session is not going to have the same level of competition, physicality as as a real life game, but then how the coach, you know, it's it's you have to do a little bit more than just all right. We're just going to make it a small sided game with a four v two, and and that intensity will naturally be there. So, no, the, the, the 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 role of the coach is essential, of course, in in, in the in the games that you play. Um, and I cannot agree more with Rui, Rui about the communication is essential. So. Um, I think every coach will know um, if you just stay, uh, stand at the line and, and passively watch the game. There, football will be played, but not at the intensity that you that you'd like to have it. Um, so what we did in our research is that we gave the coach the, the task to coach as they would do during the match, to replicate as much of the match behavior. And what you see from previous research is that the intensity of the players will go up. So that means they run more, uh, they run faster, and more sprints, etc. Um, so we try to replicate that behavior in our research as well. So the coach is essential in in um, in this type of research, and I think in every training and in every practice, of course, the coach uh, is leading, and uh, and and what he communicates or she communicates to the players um, um, is essential for how the game is played. I think another nice example of the games that we played uh, and the communication that I have with coaches when we play these types of uh, small side games, when they're new to this concept, they, they, they can follow it, they, they understand it, they, they know what, what I mean. When I actually um, lay out the pitch sizes, sometimes they have pits, um, they're like, oh, this may, might be too big for my players or this is the, the game that we never play or um, I'd like to play in small spaces because um, this is how this is our strategy when we enter the game, when we enter the match. Um, what I always reply is like, you can always encourage your players 
to adopt that playing style. So if you want to have a high pressure of your players on, on the opponent, this is also the environment, the, the, the pitch and the opportunity to play like this. So even if in those large uh, spaces, you can still encourage your players to adopt that playing style that you also want to uh, play during your actual match. So again, that is the essential role of your, of your coach. Um, and I think with every coach that I've worked with, um, whether in my research or after my research, um, they all liked the games. Um, they, they, they saw how the, the game was, was played, how the, game, how the players suddenly started to sprint more, how the variation of, of actions uh, were laid out on the pitch. And also later, and I think the drone video really helps in that as well, because it really displays how the game is played and what I, what I try to uh, bring across. And I think all those coach, coaches added um, this line of, um, of small-sided games to their, um, well, to their playbook of small-sided games. So, and, and this principle is just an addition to uh, the already existing training program. Um, so, I, like as an example, I, I, I worked together with coaches and I designed a range of small-sided games from them, from small pitches to large pitches, from small number of players to large pit number of players, ending up with uh, designing 25 to 30 small-sided games for coaches. Um, uh, so they can just pick it out. So what is, the, what is the aim of my practice? So I can pick out the number of players, I can pick out the, the pitch size, and I will play it. Sounds, yeah, that sounds like an ideal method um, and approach. I mean, Andrea, sort of to, to wrap things up, maybe bring it on how this relationship is then with, uh, with the SNC sports and science, sports scientists and the technical coaches and how you find that balance within, in when you have the opportunities to have these activation training days and, and the use of uh, the small sided games. How are you bringing that balance of the technical and physical into those sessions? Uh, clearly, we need to take into account that the, the most important aspect in the training process uh, is the collaboration with the different departments. So this is the, 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 the primary aim of our work. We need to collect information to, to share uh, uh, data about the, for example, external and internal load about the physical demands. Coaches have a, um, a different point of view, uh, sometimes but uh, more technical and tactical. So uh, um, is is uh, really important to create uh, a link between uh, between the department to try to to make our best if it's possible during practice. Uh, as a uh, is not as we said before, is not always important to recreate the. The, the most demanding passage of make play or the match demands every day during practice. It's not always the, the aim of the training sessions. Uh, sometimes uh, when we would to increase, uh, we, when we work to, to go to uh, increase the intensity in, in one training session, for example, during the week, we can uh, manage whole information all together using a small set of game or other type of exercise to try to recreate match demands, but the, the variability uh, using different format of small set game could be uh, utilized not not uh, both uh, uh, internal of one training session, but also in uh, in different training session because we can manage the training load with a small pitch size, for example, for a, a more technical part in some days. And in the middle of the week, we can utilize a greater pitch size using different format of small set game, but but with different number of players, but with always a, a great pitch size than they had a prepared during the matches to try to increase both technical, tactical and physical demands in, in, with a more holistic approach with all these athletes together in one day. And then we return in the other days to, to, to work, uh, especially in technical aspect and the, the coach normally uh, utilizes more pitch size with this aim. So as a sports scientist, in my opinion, we need to, to talk with the coaches and try to understand their, their, their process across the, the weeks, across the season, and try to, to share information useful to uh, manage their, uh, their drills 
to increase uh, the, the, the physical demands when necessary. So for example, once uh, in the week uh, or uh, when with uh, no start as the day after the match when uh, when uh, we we go to we have more than uh, than three match per week or in a day uh, so there are different actors a great variation of the of them but the, the collaboration between different uh, departments is, is really important for for these aims and, uh, and to try to 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 do the the the, the, the our best for performance development perfect Andrea, I'd like to uh, thank you for joining us today. Also to Sigrid, thank you for your, your input and sharing your, your research findings. And finally to Rui, sharing with us his, uh, his experiences and his approaches uh, in football at, at Porto and, and across Portugal. Um, one and all, thank you very much and thank you to everyone out there for your questions today.